Hi, Steve. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Uh, not bad. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. And as I never tire of saying, it's available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You know, you could be a regular podcast listener, Steve, should you choose to. That's good. I have a lot of, I have an infinite amount of time to listen to podcasts. You know, it sounds like you're being ironic. Just a little. Uh, well, the great thing about podcasts is you can do them while taking walks, exercising. Swimming is a challenge, but even that's not technically impossible. That's true. There's a, there's a product called Swim P3 that lets you listen to MP3s really soon. But I digress. Let me introduce you. You are Stephen Walt. Famous professor at Harvard, uh, what, professor of international relations at the Kennedy School, more specifically? Is that international it? affairs is the term, but it doesn't matter. Uh huh. Uh, Co author of the well known book and somewhat controversial book, The Israel Lobby, along with John Mearsheimer. But now you've written a new book that may become controversial itself. Uh, you probably hope so. It's called The Hell of Good Intentions. Yeah, I, I have one too. Oh, what a coincidence. Yeah. Uh, yours is an actual copy of the book. Mine is Bound Galleys, but the covers look the same. Subtitle is America's Foreign Policy Elite, uh, Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy. Now, it seems to me you have a problem on your hands, Steve, which is this. Uh, I assume you would like for this book to be taken very seriously and get a lot of discussion within the foreign policy establishment. But if that happens, that will kind of undermine the thesis of the book, right, which is that the foreign policy establishment is impervious to what you consider reason. Um, I think that's overstating it a little bit, but I'd say it's resistant uh, to reason, or it's a uh, it's a community that uh, is not a conspiracy. It's not like a bunch of people meeting in secret and figuring out what the line is and uh, promoting it. Uh, you know, I kind of reject all of those Bilderberg uh, trilateral commission. Uh, things that, you don't think the Illuminati is the problem? Exactly, exactly right. But it, if it's not a conspiracy, there is a lot of conformity um, and a certain mainstream consensus. And people within that community understand that if they want to succeed uh, and rise and uh, hold positions of responsibility, they've got to stay within the lines. And one of the reasons to write the book is to explain kind of how that works, explain why that's caused us so much trouble, uh, but then also broaden that conversation a little bit, try and breathe a little bit of oxygen and air into this discussion so that the United States begins to think about a wider range of strategic alternatives. So I, I, if I thought the, uh, the foreign policy elite was completely impervious, then there'd be no point in writing a book like this. I probably should have done something else. But I actually think there is sort of room and maybe even an opportunity today to try and get a broader conversation going. Well, although if you're advocating like a revolution from without, in other words, you want the grassroots to rise up and overthrow the foreign policy establishment, it could make sense to write the book. And you would like to see a little of that, right? Um, yeah, I would like to see at least the uh, range of discussion move beyond sort of all points from A to B. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe get an A to G or A to J and make it easier for people to raise questions, raise alternatives, uh, get people thinking about what hasn't worked in the past, what maybe has worked in the past, uh, start doing more of the latter, less of the former. Uh, and I think that does require ultimately the creation of, in a sense, a somewhat different uh, foreign policy establishment than the one we currently have. Okay. Um and you do name names, uh, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that, uh, which is good because it's entertaining. Um, uh, but in addition to having an indictment of the foreign policy establishment, you also have a, a broader kind of systematic diagnosis of what's gone wrong with uh, American foreign policy uh, that is, in some sense, delves deeper than the, than the establishment itself. You have a prescription. You have like your version of what a good foreign policy would be. I actually have some issues with that. I agree with a lot of it. And I hope I have time for me to uh, air some of my disagreements. In a way, they get down to I think the distinction between realism. You are what's called a foreign policy realist, and what I would call a progressive realism. But uh, but we'll see if we have time for that um, in the end. Let me quote from the book. As far as uh, your take on the world that American foreign policy has created. It says U.S. foreign policy has multiplied enemies and destabilized key regions of the world, wasted thousands of lives and trillions of dollars in failed wars, 
led to serious human rights abuses abroad and compromised important civil liberties. And we should maybe add that by enemies, you don't just mean nation states, you mean like terrorist groups. And, and I think you and I would agree that one, one kind of fuel we've given to terrorist groups is just kind of uh, giving people what they see as reason to hate us, um, which is a, a bad thing in the modern world. Right. And probably a worse, is that a worse thing than it used to be? I mean, it seems to me like a hundred years ago, it was all you really needed in a foreign policy was to make sure that all other foreign leaders either liked you or feared you. Whereas now you actually have to worry a little more about the grassroots in other countries because th they could use vehicles to attack you other than their national government, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And in, in fact, you know, some of the problems we've faced with terrorism over the last 20 years or so have been not... Uh, governments. And in fact, the terrorists are inspired in part by the fact that we are supporting certain governments in various parts of the world, and especially uh, in the Middle East, that for one reason or another are at odds with some members of that society. And because we have been so supportive of many uh, different uh, regimes in the Middle East, some of them not at all democratic, that's been one of the grievances. Um, and it's important, I think, to recognize that, that that this is part of the cost of the foreign policy we've adopted. Now, you could take the argument, you could take the position that our foreign policy has been basically right, um, and that this is just part of the price of doing business, that in order to have uh, and defend certain strategic interests in, say, the Middle East, we're going to have to partner up with a bunch of countries that uh, maybe, because of their actions at home, have generated some terrorism, and that terrorism is going to blow back on us, but it's still the right policy. The problem is, of course, that Americans keep getting told that this has nothing to do with our foreign policy. It's just that they hate our values. They hate what America stands for. That's why they're coming after us. And my point is simply to say, no, they're coming after us mostly because they don't like our actions in a variety of fronts. And we have to at least put that as part of the cost side of the ledger, along with whatever the alleged benefits might be. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the most famous actions, uh, hatred-inducing actions, is the invasion of Iraq, and you spend some time on that, as well as some of the other uh, famously antagonist, or, 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 or in some corners, much criticized things we've done, such as uh, regime change in Libya, maybe the war in Afghanistan, but you certainly spend time in the war in Iraq. Now, there is one kind of narrative about why we blundered into the war in Iraq, uh, and I just want to run through it, because you're you, your critique is actually broader than this in a certain sense. So, so the, the, the narrower narrative is that, which may be true insofar as it goes, but it's that 9-11 provided an opportunity for some neoconservatives who had long wanted regime change in Iraq to gain influence within the Bush administration and the country more broadly, and they led us into that war. Now, I don't I'm not sure you'd take issue with that, and you certainly are no fan of neocons, and you certainly name some names there. But that said, there's a broader critique you have about a, a an ideology that is in some sense larger than neoconservatism, but encompasses it. Yeah. And you're saying has ever since the end of the Cold War held sway in America. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I mean, one of the points I'm trying to make is, although uh, certainly I'm critical of neoconservatism and where it has led us, that that's not an outlier, uh, that neo neocons are not uh, some, uh, you know, fringe element in the American foreign policy elite. And in fact, what's really been going on here is a bipartisan consensus, uh, really, ever since uh, the end of the Cold War. Um, and one of the ways I try to illustrate this is just to compare sort of the world we the world we had in sort of 1993, 94, um, and what everyone's expectations were going to happen uh, in the future, and the world we see today. In 1993, 94, you know, our relationships with all the major powers, including Russia and China, are reasonably good, uh, quite positive in some cases, but at least amicable and businesslike uh, with the others. Uh, 1993, 94, democracy is spreading, uh, the EU is expanding, uh, NATO is beginning to move towards expanding. Globalization is proceeding. Uh, Iraq has been disarmed. Iran has no nuclear centrifuges in operation in 1993-94. In fact, it doesn't have any in operation in the year uh, 2000, uh, for that matter. 
Uh, North Korea, we think we've capped its nuclear program in 1994. It's really looking like a pretty wonderful world. And the expectation, which you see in, say, Frank Fukuyama's uh, idea about the end of history, you see in a lot of the writings of Tom Friedman in that period, is that the rest of the world is gradually going to conform itself to the American vision. We've got the model, uh, liberal democracy, rule of law, free markets, uh, etc. This is the only thing that really works in a globalized world. You know, China's developing, but they're, uh, the middle class is going to rise there. They're going to demand political rights, so it's going to become a democracy, and everything's going to be really wonderful. And so what the Clinton administration starts doing, and it's continued under Bush, and it even continues under Obama, is trying to actively spread American values far and wide, peacefully if possible, but if necessary, with the use of military force in a number of, uh, of instances. And the problem is that this project, which I and some other people have called a project of liberal hegemony, uh, has been an almost complete failure. If you look where we are today, relations with Russia and China are worse than at any time since the Cold War. They're collaborating together. Uh, we see democracy in retreat. I think Freedom House says it's the 12th consecutive year of decline, overall declines in global freedom. We see places like Poland and Hungary moving in an illiberal direction. Uh, instead of the peace that we all thought the Oslo process would bring us in the Middle East, we have, uh, I think, the effective end of a two-state solution. Uh, repeated American efforts to promote one are all failures. The Middle East itself inflames in a variety of places. The regimes we overthrow ending up as failed states rather than as flourishing democracies. So, uh, and this was a bipartisan project all the way along, uh, equally supported by Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, you can't, you know, see this as one party or the other. Um, and with, and hence, hence the title of the book, with the best of intentions, we've ended up with exactly the opposite of what we thought was going to happen back when we launched this project in the 1990s. Okay, so the term liberal hegemony, why don't you uh, drill down on that a little? I mean, one thing liberal means there is the so-called liberal international order, right? And we should probably explain that a little. The hegemony part means that we think that the, the only or at least best way to foster a liberal international order and spread kind of liberal values, liberal more in the 19th century sense, not in the left-right sense, um, is for is for there to be a hegemon and we volunteer for the job uh to to be to dominate the world and uh foster these values you know you would think there's a little tension between the ideas of liberal and hegemony and you know but maybe that's just a semantic irony and and maybe it could have maybe it's a coherent worldview in so far as it goes and it's just that as in your view it didn't work uh, maybe in principle it could have or something but uh, you want to say a little bit about the liberal international order that they meant to preserve before you start talking about how their plans went awry? Yeah, well, I think you summarized it actually pretty well. Uh, liberal in this context does not mean left, right? It does refer to the sort of 19th century ideas about liberalism, uh, the encouragement of democracy, individual freedom, uh, markets, property rights, rule of law, etc., and on the international stage, then, uh, the promotion of a set of institutions, uh, multilateral institutions, uh, that would, uh, manage, guide, smooth relations, uh, between different countries would foster globalization in a variety of ways. So open up markets, uh, to both trade, but also, uh, to investment, create structures like the World Trade Organization that could manage, uh, this process as well. So that's the liberal. Uh, part of this. And when you think of a liberal world order, it's a world order where most of the countries, if not all the countries in it, are liberal states. That is to say, they're democracies with free markets, individual rights, mm -hmm. things like that. And their relationships are structured or managed within a set of institutions that they've all, or rules that they've all kind of signed up to and agree to live by. When you hear phrases like a rules-based international order, 
Uh, that's what they mean. So that's the liberal part. The hegemony part was this assumption that you couldn't get to that world and you couldn't keep that world if the United States wasn't running the project. We had to be in charge. And uh, you see this in the constant invocation, uh, phrases like the need for American global leadership. Uh, go back to, say, uh, the Obama administration's various national security strategies. The word leadership appears, you know, multiple times on almost every page. That this is absolutely essential. Um, this is what's uh, quite explicit in Madeleine Albright's remark that, you know, the United States is the indispensable power mm -hmm. that sees farther than other states do and therefore is entitled, has the right, the responsibility, and the wisdom to run this project. And, and again, this is not a, um, it's not greedy, right? It's a, it, or it's not explicitly greedy because I think many of the, the architects of this idea uh, genuinely believe that this would be good for the United States to promote this kind of an order and use American power to do it. And it would be good for the rest of the world too. Mm -hmm. uh, and notice one final thing about it. This is not a status quo policy. The United States beginning in the mid early to mid 1990s did not have a sort of let's keep ourselves safe and prosperous and maybe intervene a little bit in various places to avoid real dangers this is very much a revisionist grand strategy we want to alter politics in different parts of the world we want countries that aren't democratic to become democratic we want countries that aren't part of our set of institutions to join those institutions on our terms and we're going to use american power sometimes gently, sometimes not so gently, to bring that about. Mm. So it's a very ambitious foreign policy, and it's not surprising that some countries didn't like the idea very much. Yeah, and can I point to something that I think is more than a semantic irony? I don't think this is something you emphasize a whole lot, and this may point to a distinction between realism and progressive realism, but part of the idea of the liberal international order, of a rules-based order, is that there are rules and people comply with them International law is a set of rules, and the U.S. generally presidents have said that they like international law, but the fact is that part of being a hegemon was for us to feel entitled to violate international law whenever we felt like it. So, so the Iraq war was a clear violation of international law. I think most people would say that the Libyan intervention, once it passed from just protecting those civilians, which was authorized by the U.N. Security Council, into regime change, which wasn't, I think most people say that was a violation of international law. But at any rate, my point is that uh, we, as part of what you're complaining about here, we were violating the rules that supposedly we were there to get people to uphold. And it's, you know, as, as, as any parent or teacher can tell you, is it's, it's, it's harder to get people to obey rules when powerful people are seen to ignore them routinely. Right now. Now, how big a problem is that for you? Because it's not really a huge emphasis of yours. Well, I, I, I think it is a problem. I, I don't say a great deal about it, uh, in part because I'm, again, more of a real realist rather than a progressive realist. Right. Like, realists have always sort of understood that great powers like to set rules, but are free. And, and by the way, follow those rules most of the time because it, in fact, is easier. It's a little bit like, you know, we all tend to obey traffic laws most of the time because it's just more convenient to do that. And of course, it's much more convenient if everybody's doing that almost all the time. Um, but if you're a major power, and especially if you're as powerful as the United States, you can break those rules uh, when you want to, when you think it's sufficiently important and other states are pretty much going to have to live with it. It does... Uh, as I think you implied, does start to erode the fabric of this rules-based order and other states will, uh, particularly if they become more powerful, uh, start looking for exceptions, looking for loopholes, looking for ways where they may not feel like they have to comply. And of course, if the United States then says, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're violating the NPT, you're building islands in the South China Sea, you're cheating on the World Trade Organization, they can, of course, turn around and say, well, of course, but, you know, you similar things. And it does undercut, I think, the legitimacy of American foreign policy if we do too much of this. Uh, I'm enough of a realist to say, you know, all countries are going to uh, cheat on occasion and great powers will probably cheat more visibly and more often than others. But this is not cost free either.
It's not. And I mean, just the other thing I'd say about that is it's certainly true that historically great powers have done what, you know, the realist view says they would do. Um, on the other hand, you know, the world is changing. And, and I don't know, I've, I've mentioned this on other podcasts probably, but, you know, Hans Morgenthau in, in, in uh, his book, uh, what is his most famous book, uh, Politics Among Nations or something? Is that That's the most famous. I don't think it's his best, but it's his most famous. Well, well maybe this is why I don't think it's his best. But he actually says, he's, he's the paradigmatic realist, and he says, I can imagine a situation if, as history unfolds, where world government would be championed by a realist. So I, I say that just by way of noting that it's possible that – that new things are possible as the world does become more intertwined and interdependent. And, and what I'm thinking of specifically is when the Cold War ended, I had the sense, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but the Persian Gulf War was actually in compliance with international law. We, we got the Security Council together, convinced them it was a thing to do, so they mandated it. Fine. I remember, like, that seemed so radically new after the Cold War to see, like, the world getting together and, like, talking about whether a war was legitimate. And I don't think it's crazy to believe that if the U.S. had really made it its goal at that point to establish the norm of compliance with international law, we might be living in a somewhat different world. And it might be easier to get, say, China to take border disputes to respect the view of international panels on border disputes and so on. Uh, that Maybe that's naive, but I think in any event, we completely blew the opportunity if it was there. Right. And I, and I do think one of the problems here, and I don't spend a lot of time on this, in an, in an early draft of the book, I actually had an old chapter about this problem. But I mean, I see sort of two dimensions to what uh, where the United States went off course. One dimension, it's the permissive condition was the sheer power, wealth and security that the United States had this position of primacy. We found ourselves in as the Cold War came to an end, the Soviet Union disappeared. And for a brief period, all these favorable trends seem to be happening around the world. We really do think the wind is at our back. We can do almost anything. Mm -hmm. And it, it would have required an extremely mature country to say, well, there's a, an, a number of things we could do here. We might have to, you know, uh, break the rules a little bit and then to have had the self-restraint not to have uh, been tempted by that. So that's part of the problem. The second part of the problem uh, is that the, and this is what the most, much of the book is about, is that the foreign policy elite very quickly uh, again, in both parties, decided this was an opportunity to push uh, a rather crusading agenda in a variety of ways. Interestingly enough, you know, because they thought um, that global trends were really running in a positive, progressive direction, they thought it was going to be easy. This mm -hmm. wasn't going to be expensive to do this. Uh, the Clinton administration, I think, thought NATO expansion, for example, moving uh, NATO eastward was essentially cost free. You could extend security guarantees uh, into Eastern Europe. Russia really wouldn't mind. And if Russia did mind, uh, we would tell them it wasn't directed against them and they'd believe us. And furthermore, they were so weak in the 90s, they really couldn't do anything about it. And therefore, those commitments would never have to be honored because we would be extending a zone of peace eastward. And you can multiply similar things. The Clinton administration, I think, really believed this was all going to happen rather smoothly and easily. And we were just going to sort of nudge world politics in a progressive direction. It wasn't going to be all that expensive. You get to the Bush administration, and again, they think the war in Iraq is going to be easy because the American military is magical. We had ousted the Taliban in a couple of months. That all seemed to be going very swimmingly. So we can go in, knock off Saddam Hussein. Political parties will form. Democracy will flourish. Uh, other countries in the region will be intimidated and will eventually fall like ripe fruit. Uh, I think if Bush had ever understood what he was walking into, of course, he would not have made the decision. And again, it was partly the hubris born of the extraordinary power the United States had and the sense we had for a while um, that everything was running in our direction. And of course, if that's the case, you know, just following the rules because they are rules, uh, that again requires a, a more self-discipline than I think uh, we're, uh, we're prone to. Yeah. So um, I think probably most people are fairly familiar with kind of the list of uh, foreign policy blunders since Bush, at least as seen by people like you and like me. I mean, there is, 
there are the things we've mentioned, you know, I I Iraq, Libya. I think you and I both uh, think that funneling uh, arms into the Syrian civil war just wound up getting more people killed and creating more refugees to no good end. Uh, I, I don't think either of us is a huge fan of uh, the, the ongoing uh, reign of drone strikes. Um, for the most part, you may have some cases where you approve of them, and you could probably find somewhere. But, but I think that that part of the critique is familiar. But your, your, your critique also focuses, as you've suggested, on the pre-Bush years. Uh, and so one of your problems is the expansion of NATO. Why don't you talk about what the downside of that was, what the blowback was, and also mention any other like big blunders you see in that era? Well, in, in some sense, Bill Clinton got, um, got lucky because the consequences of some of his larger foreign policy mistakes, and they're mistakes consistent with this picture I'm presenting, uh, didn't come home to roost until after he was president. And so two obvious ones, uh, and there are, I think, probably some others. Uh, first, NATO expansion, where the principal problem there uh, was twofold. One is it did, as many people warned at the time, it did, in fact, poison the relationship with Russia. It's not the only thing that did. Uh, getting out of the ABM treaty uh, uh, hurt. Uh, toppling Gaddafi in Libya uh, also hurt as well. So there's a, a large... Uh, Kos Kos the Kosovo intervention, which, by the way, was not legal under international law, not clearly legal. Uh, then the, the perceived meddling in the Ukrainian election more, much more recently, which I don't think it was entirely a hallucination on Putin's part. No, that, that's exactly right. So there's a, a long series of things here the United States has done, but it starts with the decision to expand NATO, which, uh, and there is something of a, a historian's dispute on this, but there's, I think, a good case to be made that the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, back when the Soviet Union was breaking up and Germany was reunifying, did in fact pledge that NATO would not expand further east beyond the reunification of Germany. Uh, the Soviets, uh, I think, made a mistake in not getting that in writing. Uh, very clearly. But there are statements that uh, you know, Secretary of State James Baker made and others to key Soviet officials suggesting that if they allowed German reunification to proceed, that would be it. NATO would not go any further. So again, from a Russian perspective, this has been a violation of some promises we've made way back, uh, way back when. The point is that now, if you look at the situation there, NATO expansion is the first step in really poisoning the relationship with Russia. And the right policy would have been the so-called partnership for peace, which was the Clinton administration's original idea. You create new security structures in Europe. You have some civil military collaboration. Uh, the United States can start to partner in various ways with East European militaries. Uh, and very importantly, partnership for peace included Russia. It did not exclude Russia. Russia was going to be openly part, be able to participate in the whole thing. And I think with hindsight, that would have been a much smarter uh, move. So that's one. Uh, the second thing the Clinton administration did was the policy of dual containment in the Persian Gulf. Uh, this was the idea that instead of letting Iran and Iraq check each other, which had basically been American policy ever since the Iranian Revolution, um, we were going to contain both of them we were going to be responsible for keeping both of them in a box simultaneously, even though they didn't like each other. And in order, this is, by the way, done early Clinton, so it's after the first Gulf War. To do this required us to leave air and ground forces in Saudi Arabia. Right? And this, by the way, is all linked to the Oslo peace process. We were going to contain Iran and Iraq to reassure Israel, so Israel would feel safer. And therefore, Israel would be more willing to make concessions in the Oslo process, leading hopefully to two states. Remind me, did the Oslo process lead to a two-state solution? No, it didn't. <laughs> uh, that's a whole different set of uh, different set of failures. And again, a bipartisan failure because Clinton failed and Bush failed and Obama failed, despite mm -hmm. uh, some efforts in various ways. In any case, dual containment requires the United States to leave troops in the Gulf. And it becomes one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the important reasons why Osama bin Laden decides that this is horrible. These are infidels and in sacred uh, Muslim territory, and therefore mm -hmm. he's got to go after the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think you can make a plausible argument that had the United States not adopted dual containment, Al Qaeda would still have existed. Al Qaeda might have still gone after American forces in the Middle East, but it would have been less likely to have come after the United States. And maybe 9-11 becomes less likely. 
Mm. Now, of course, Clinton is no longer president when the relationship with Russia goes south and when 9-11 happens. But I think the taproot of those problems begins in Clinton, not in Bush. Bush just makes it. No, although I would say, you know, in terms of Osama bin Laden and things that gave rise to him, the kind of cauldron in Afghanistan that we had helped create by funneling arms into Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. And, you know, I know that you say the Cold War was for the most part done more rationally than post-Cold War foreign policy has been done. You cite Vietnam as a notable exception. But I personally think that in retrospect, I wasn't saying this at the time, like in 19... 79 or whenever it started under Jimmy Carter and was sustained under Reagan. But in retrospect, wouldn't it have been better for pretty much all concerned to have just let the Soviets uh, basically take Afghanistan? I mean, they considered it a, a client state. So they moved, they moved troops in to secure order. And it was at that point that we started fomenting an insurrection that as local circumstances had it would become a religious would become a jihad. And, and, and that helped give birth to Osama bin Laden. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's certainly, with, with full benefit of hindsight, you can go back and say that. I think that falls under the heading of sometimes the solution to one problem does, in fact, beget the next set of problems in ways one really could not have fully anticipated. Mm -hmm. I think there, it, it really would have required an act of extraordinary imagination to imagine that helping the Afghan Mujahideen in precisely the way that we did, funneling the money through Saudi Arabia, backing Pakistan, etc., was ultimately going to produce what it did. Um, it, we know that now, but I, I guess I will give the Reagan administration, uh, you know, cut them some slack for not having seen that coming. I think that's very different than something like um, saying, you know, uh, this Russia is the uh, is a great power with a long history and great powers are always sensitive to what's going on on their borders. Russia feels humiliated by the defeat in the Cold War and therefore taking the American-led alliance system and just continuing to push it eastward and constantly saying that this is open-ended. There is no end point to this thing. And next we're going to do Ukraine and maybe we're going to do Georgia. It's very easy to anticipate what the reaction there is going to be. And one can argue about whether or not it's worth it. That is, some would say, yes, it was still a good policy, even though the relationship with Russia is now uh, really quite bad. But that's an easy one to have anticipated and many people did. The situation with the blowback from Afghanistan is a little bit more extended, a little more uh, indefinite. So I, I don't, I'm not as. I, I, I agree, much harder to envision. So, um, so let's turn to this issue of like the people who sustain what you call liberal hegemony, which encompasses both neoconservatism and liberal interventionism. Um, uh, let me let me read from the book your. Uh, your one sentence takeaway today's I don't think they're going to find this entirely flattering uh, members of the foreign policy elite. Here's the here's the sentence. Today's foreign policy elite is a dysfunctional cast of privileged insiders who are frequently disdainful of alternative perspectives and insulated both professionally and personally from the consequences of the policies they promote. Uh, have you pointed this out to them before? Or will this be the first time? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not the first person to point this out, and I, I, I think it is largely true. There's a, a chapter in the book, and it's probably the chapter that's going to make me uh, you know, generate the most uh, anger or concern is one about accountability, uh, which basically points out that for most people in the foreign policy elite, uh, there's hardly any uh, failure that actually has professional consequences for you. So you can screw up repeatedly and still be reappointed uh, in a variety of ways. And you can see this in a number of different contexts. Uh, consider that the current national security advisor in the United States, John Bolton, uh, was a longtime fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is not, in fact, uh, an outlier in the Washington ferment. He's on the hawkish end of the spectrum, but he's a you yes. know, former, uh, former diplomat, uh, publishes in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and lots of mainstream uh, places, and was an open, ardent, 
enthusiastic advocate of the invasion of Iraq and has called for regime change in Iran and North Korea as well. Um, and yet, no matter how badly his previous prescriptions have turned out, doesn't seem to have derailed his career at any uh, particular point. Uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, someone like, uh, like Paul Wolfowitz. So again, ardent uh, architect of the war in Iraq going back to the 1990s, doesn't do particularly well uh, in the Pentagon under, under Bush. What happens when he leaves the Pentagon? Bush appoints him to be president of the World Bank, even though he's not an economist, he's not a development expert. He lasts about two years in that job, has to resign, and go, uh, immediately lands a, a nice sinecure, again, at the American Enterprise Institute, and gets appointed, by the way, to the State Department's International Security Advisory Board. And you can multiply examples like this. And, of course, there are, there are Democratic Party uh, equivalents uh, as well. So part, and finally, if you then look and say, well, well who does get into trouble? Well, you get into trouble if you go outside the sort of consensus and I have a number of discussions in there of people who at one point or another put their heads up above the parapet and said, you know, this is really makes no sense. It's all going wrong. And guess what? They end up sort of marginalized. Clint Leverett, Hillary Mann. Uh, well, my favorite example is actually an army colonel, uh, Paul Yingling, who wrote an article based on his service in Iraq uh, that was very critical of the senior army leadership. This is an article, by the way, that was hailed for being insightful, was assigned at West Point, assigned at the Command and General Staff College. But of course, uh, Colonel Yingling was not rewarded for this. He was passed over for promotion and is now teaching high school in Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when I say that we have something of an inbred elite, uh, I think that's that's right. And it's it's a self-protective elite, uh, like many other elites as well, that, you know, today's uh, enemy may be tomorrow's ally. And uh, nobody wants to be too critical, because after all, if you're critical of someone, if it's your turn in office, um, then people are going to have the knives out uh, for you as well. I, I want to add one other point here, though, just because it's very important. Um, and I say this in the book, this is a tricky issue, uh, accountability, because you don't want to be so sort of uh, vengeful or critical or harsh in dealing with public officials that uh, the first mistake, you know, rules someone's career uh, out forever, right? Mm -hmm. We have to be somewhat tolerant of uh, the fact that we all make mistakes um, and people often get better in their jobs. Uh, you know, they screw up in their first tour, but they do better subsequently. So one has to have a certain measure of uh, forgiveness here. But if you have the same people advocating the same policies, the policies keep working out very, very badly, and they keep getting reappointed. At that point, I think is entitled to ask questions about how well the system is working. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, uh, you, you, uh, I mentioned, uh, I, I, did, I wasn't aware of that uh, Army colonel before I read the book. Um, I did know Flint Leverett a little, whom you also mentioned, and his wife, Hillary Mann. And I will say, I mean, he didn't always evince the smooth, the, the smoothest kind of the social skills, and and uh, and people raised money, uh, dark questions about where he was getting his funding. But it's it's the point is just that people within the consensus get away with that kind of stuff. John Bolton is not exactly a you know a dream of a cocktail party guest. And I will say, actually, in defense of the establishment, they have kind of looked at him with askance. I think uh, looked at him askance. You know, he he he's. I, I think it almost took a Donald Trump to bring him back into an administration, but 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 certainly uh, I, I I wouldn't have ruled out him uh, getting an appointment in a Marco Rubio. President. Well, may, you may be right. You may be right. It, it may be that bad, but but you're right about how much of a social club it is. You know, I mean, I remember I was talking to someone at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which in theory, as mainstream think tanks go is like, you know, as much to my liking almost as it's going to get within that admittedly narrow realm. And at that point, I guess this was before the Iraq War, but they had uh, Bob Kagan, as, as you know, the neoconservative, certainly then. Um, and I was talking to somebody at Carnegie, and I was like, uh, he doesn't exactly fit in, does he? And he just said, oh, oh, but he can stay as long as he wants. Everybody loves Bob. And I thought, you know, I've met him. He seems nice. I don't, I'm not, that's not my question. My question is like, do you stand for anything? I mean, and it's the, the degree of fraternizing along 
supposedly important, across supposedly important ideological, I mean, I'm not saying you have to be rude to people, no. but, but the active kind of assistance. Well, and, and that's a central theme of the book, that in a sense that, that if you look at the world, there are two imbalances of power in the world that really matter. One is the imbalance between the United States and most other countries where we're far more powerful. And the second imbalance is inside Washington. There's an imbalance of power between voices and organizations that are in favor of American global leadership and intervention and shaping the world according to our dictates and organizations and institutions and individuals who think the United States ought to act with a bit greater restraint. It's not like those voices are completely absent um, but they're, they are strongly outnumbered. Um, as, as you undoubtedly saw in the book, one of the ways I try to uh, establish that there really is this consensus view is by looking at these three different task forces. Um, uh, one is the so-called Princeton Project on National Security, which came out in 2006. The other is a project called the uh, Project for a United and Strong America, which came out in 2013. And then the final one was... The now, Steve, are you opposed to United and Strong America? <laughs> no. And by the way, look, look how united we are today. Oh, I guess it didn't work out. Well, maybe they didn't follow the recommendations. Right. Um, What's interesting about these three, these three different task forces, they're written over a 10-year period, right? The first one, the Princeton Project, is before the financial crisis and really before Iraq has fully gone south. The second two are, of course, after the financial crisis, and one is right at the very end of Obama, right? The circumstances in the world are radically different, in these, and the three reports are essentially interchangeable. They all make the same recommendations. They all believe every square inch of the planet is a vital interest of the United States where we have to be actively involved and actively engaged. And of course, the people, then they're bipartisan, they're Republicans and Democrats, um, and they're really a, almost a, a, a textbook example of exactly what the mainstream consensus is. My problem is that that mainstream consensus has been guiding American foreign policy now for a quarter century. And the results have been not without some successes, but far more failures and far more consequential failures than successes. And that's the point at which we ought to ask what's gone wrong here. And by the way, one final point is I believe this was part, not the major part, but a non-trivial part of what got Donald Trump to the presidency. Because as you know, he was extremely critical of the foreign policy establishment. That establishment was equally critical of him, especially on the Republican side. And yet when he went out and told audiences that American foreign policy is a complete and total disaster, a lot of Americans nodded their heads because they saw a lot of failures out there and they didn't see a lot of successes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned that ISIS in the book, that ISIS probably wouldn't be around if it weren't for the Iraq war. And if you imagine an election just without ISIS, just take that off the board, take that away from Donald Trump's talking points, he may lose. You don't know. And, and uh, but but um, so you mentioned uh, these reports. Now, in the book, you go into you go beyond the think tank world. You go into to journalists and who have not been held accountable in spite of uh reporting uh, consequentially false things before the Iraq war, implicating Saddam Hussein uh, in ways that turned out to be, um, uh, indicting him in ways that turned out to be uh, flawed. Um, and you also s said, I mean, here in talking to me, that, that there were Democrats as well as Republicans, liberals as well as conservatives. Uh, I, I don't think you've actually mentioned uh, any names in the Democrat liberal side so with all that as preface, do you want to just mention some more, some more, uh, create some more enemies, and just in case they don't read the book, but do listen to the podcast? Uh, well, I think if you, it, you know, you could uh, look at the Obama administration. My own view of this is that the Obama administration, uh, Obama had a somewhat different view of what American foreign policy should be. Uh, should be. He had, uh, you know, maybe not a sophisticated realist view, but something of a, a, a more realist approach. But he was uh, unusual within his own administration. Uh, his most of the key people he appointed uh, or retained had been, for example, advocates of invading Iraq in 2000. Right. Uh, Joe Biden supported it. 
Uh, Hillary Clinton supported it. Jim Steinberg, who was Deputy Secretary of State, uh, supported it. Robert Gates, who he retained as Secretary of Defense, had supported the war. So in a sense, Obama was uh, more moderate, I'm not sure I'd call him progressive, more moderate uh, in his foreign policy leanings than most of the people he supported. Susan Rice, also big interventionist, my colleague and friend, Samantha Power. Michael, also- Michael McFall in Russia, the in right. Russian, Russian ambassador. Exactly. So, so, you know, he has a Democratic Party foreign policy establishment that's kind of in the Madeleine Albright school. That, you right. know, the world is out there. We're indispensable. We've got to be running it. And so you, you almost see Obama uh, pulling it back against his own administration. Uh, he doesn't want to escalate in Afghanistan. He knows that this is a loser, that sending, uh, you know, 40,000 more troops is not going to change anything substantially, but he feels he can't. He's not going to be outflanked to the right, certainly. Mm -hmm. Um, He's going to try and do as much as he can with drones, with special forces, which he ramps up, does even more uh, than Bush. He's very deferential to the intelligence services, never tries to discipline them in any particular way. Um, Does just enough in Syria, as you mentioned a while back, to make things worse without solving them. All right. Um, when we try to sponsor a negotiation early in the uh, Syrian civil war, uh, we explicitly exclude Iran. Mm-hmm. But of course, if you exclude Iran, then you're not going to get an agreement because Iran's enough of a spoiler there to be able to, to veto anything. Um, he reluctantly uh, agrees to help overthrow Gaddafi in Libya, something he later says is right. the biggest mistake he made as president. So you can see that that the establishment is pushing him to do a variety of things that I think Obama had real doubts about, but he was just one guy and he could not, even as president, could not turn. But why did he appoint? I, I mean, you're right. It is ironic because uh, especially in light of the fact that Ben Rhodes, his kind of speechwriter and to some extent d- informal foreign policy advisor, although Ben Rhodes had no deep background in foreign policy, but in any event, he was kind of, I think, those two were kind of to some extent on the same wavelength. And Ben Rhodes tells us that they referred to the foreign policy establishment as, quote, the blob. It's right. a term you adopt in the book. And I, I think it's pretty apt, you know, to it's just this undifferentiated mass. Yes, there are neocons. Yes, there are liberal interventionists. But they're, they 90% of the time they're pushing in the same direction. Um, but the, so the puzzle is, why did Obama appoint all these people? Obviously, you're going to become captive to them. Is it just that there are no alternatives in the world or what? Pretty much um, that that you and, and by the way, this is in a different way, the same problem Donald Trump has had, um, who clearly wanted to do a lot of things differently as well. But if you ask yourself, you've got a lot of jobs you have to fill. Right. And you want to fill them with people who are on your wavelength and also have enough experience that they won't make a zillion rookie mistakes. Uh, I'm quite confident that if Barack Obama had appointed you, me, and a bunch of people that are like-minded folks. I'm still available, by the way. If if Donald Trump, I don't know if Trump listens to this podcast. I'm available. I'm sure we would have done some smart things, but we would have also made some mistakes as well because we hadn't done these jobs before. We would be learning as we do it. And the point is there aren't very many of us. Uh, that's a real problem. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, Obama faced this. But there, there are in the academy, and, and that's the big distinction. I mean, if you look at universities across America, there's a ton of people saying reasonable things, but they don't have the Washington experience, and they're not going to be invited to join a Washington think tank. That's exactly right. I think that's, that's a big part of it as well. And by the way, this is, of course, the same problem that Trump has. I mean, first of all, Trump probably doesn't think he's going to even win the presidency, so who cares? If you looked at his campaign, he had no foreign policy bold-faced names. Uh, you know, the closest he had to an expert was Michael Flynn, and Michael Flynn was regarded as kind of a nutcase anyway, and set a record that will never be broken, lasting as national security advisor for what twenty-four days or something like that. Um, so, so one of the reasons Trump's foreign policy has been such a train wreck is that he didn't have any experienced people. But he could appoint lots of jobs were unfilled. A few were filled by oddballs that uh, quickly screwed up in various ways. And he ends up having to appoint a number of people who probably don't share his views, uh, whatever his views might be. 
Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book on uh, which is uh, entitled "How Not to Fix Foreign Policy," which is again my views on why Trump is not the answer mm -hmm. here uh, here either. But he had the same problem Obama did. He wanted to do foreign policy differently, and he had almost no one he could appoint who would help him. I, I think there's also the problem that kind of Bannonite ethno nationalism, which helped shape Trump's worldview, I think does depict radical, well, Islam broadly, forget the radical part, Islam broadly almost is, is the enemy because it's a cultural, it's an ethno-cultural war to ban him. And, and Iran was singled out for particular demonization. So that, and that has kind of happened to mesh with the neoconservative impulse in particular and, and, and much of the rest of the uh, Washington foreign policy establishment. So I think in that way, some of the stars were aligned for where we are now with Iran, and that actually leads to a, another question about the book, which is, um, or about your argument, which is, okay, so with Iran, it's like, um, it's not, if you ask, well, where does the deeper impetus, like shaping the think tanks come from that drives us toward uh, really an unnecessary degree of antagonism with Iran in the view of, of me and I think you, you know, the answers there are kind of straightforward. I mean, um, uh, of course, there's, you know, quote, pro-Israel people of a right-wing persuasion, particularly. Increasingly, there's Gulf states that are increasingly giving money to think tanks, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and so on. And of course, uh, the defense industry is never uh, going to get in the way of something that requires weapons. So there's like these various interests you could point to. But as for the larger imperative of liberal hegemony, which you're saying has been, in a sense, the largest force driving all of that, I don't totally get where the impetus comes from. It's like, why isn't there, why are all the think tanks in favor of it? Why aren't there think tanks that aren't, and so on? Well, part of it is, is there is a, a bit of a, uh, there are some, there are a handful, uh, you know, places like Cato, for example, because it comes out of a sort of libertarian worldview, uh, wants to have a more modest defense establishment, more modest foreign policy in general. So that's uh, an outlier within the Washington world. And you can find some other uh, think tanks that are kind of like that uh, as well. So it's not like there are no other voices uh, in this. It's just that the chorus is much louder than these occasional uh, soloists uh, singing, a slightly, uh, singing a slightly different uh, song. I think the other thing is that there's a bit of... Um, uh, of log rolling going on here. You have lots of different lobbies and interest groups and think tanks in Washington, and they don't have necessarily complete agreement on every issue and different priorities and all of that. But in a sense, America global leadership being indispensable is consistent with all of them. They all want the United States to be doing something somewhere on behalf of someone and sometimes that's human rights. You know, we wanted, we should be out there preventing atrocities. We should be getting tough with Burma. We should be pushing uh, countries in different parts of the world to behave better towards their people. And we should use American power to do that. We should threaten them with sanctions. And if that doesn't work, we should do even more. And we do this for purely, uh, you know, humanitarian reasons, even when our strategic interests are at odds. That Those groups are there. There are other people who say, well, our real issue is weapons of mass destruction. And anytime we see a country that's moving towards them, we should come down on them like a ton of bricks and make sure they don't move in that direction. And somebody else will say, well, we have to maintain the balance of power here at some critical resource, sea lines of communication or whatever. We start adding up all these different groups who will all have a different thing they want to prioritize. And the easy thing to do is say, well, as long as we're uh, the hegemonic power and really uh, uh, engaged everywhere, we can address all of these things, even if some of them may be contradictory. And, you know, what you're doing with your left hand is not always consistent with what you're doing with your right hand. So it's almost like an implicit favor swapping among the elite club. It's like you support my cause, I'll support yours. I don't think they necessarily think of it that way, but as long as they all subscribe to the broader ideology, they're all getting along with each other. That's right. I think that's very much uh, uh, to a first approximation, a lot of what goes on here. Yeah. So let's get to uh, where I, I know you got to go before too long. Um, how much time do you have at this point? About five minutes. So let's get to your offshore balancing thing. And here you mentioned, uh, well, you just mentioned, uh, you kind of alluded to it, but here is your prescription. Uh, I don't, um, 
I'm not sure I'm totally on board with it, partly because it doesn't get into the things I'm interested in, global governance, international law. Uh, but I also wonder if as much of it is necessary as I think you think is necessary. But, but tell me if I'm wrong. Offshore balancing is the idea that we need to look to places around the world where a hegemon could arise that could threaten our interests. And we need to maintain enough of a balance of power regionally, not, not balance them explicitly with our own power, but help smaller powers kind of counterbalance them. So for example, in Asia, you would help Japan, South Korea, whatever, keep from getting overrun by China. Um, so, I mean, first of all, is that a fair, and you see a few regions where you think of a little, ba- you, see, you even think a little balancing is order in, the, in order around the Persian Gulf because of oil. Is that a fair summary of offshore balancing? That, that's a fair summary. I just highlight a couple of things. This is mostly uh, referring to where the United States is militarily committed, where we would actually be willing to send Americans to put their lives at risk for a set of foreign policy goals. So you can be an offshore balancer and say, you know, we don't have vital strategic interests. We're not going to fight and die for this area or that area at present, given the configurations of power there, and still be in favor of trading with other countries, still be in favor of diplomatic relations. In fact, you need to have good diplomatic relations with lots of of countries. It's not about uh, isolationism. It's not about Fortress America at all. It's about saying that the United States needs to be somewhat selective about where it commits itself uh, to support particular countries, and if necessary, be willing to use military force to help those countries. Um, During the Cold War, being an offshore balancer actually required us to be onshore in Europe because the Soviet threat was a serious threat. It required us, in my view, to have close alliance partnerships in Asia. Now, today, I don't think there are serious military threats to Europe. Europe has various problems for which American military power is no longer the answer. And the United States should be disengaging militarily from Europe, not diplomatically, not economically. Similarly, in my view, the Middle East is as divided and uh, and incapable of being dominated as it's ever been. If Saudi Arabia is not taking over, Turkey's not taking over, Iran's not taking over, Israel's not taking over, which means America's job's pretty easy. No one's going to dominate the Persian Gulf or the Middle East, and we don't have to do very much. And if it turns out somebody does emerge and starts looking dangerous, then we might have to do more. The real challenge is in Asia, where China is continuing to rise, is getting more ambitious, and holding a balancing coalition in Asia together is not going to be easy. So again, it's not isolationism. It's suggesting you have to look at the configurations of power in the world and figure out where the United States needs to focus most of its attention. What we've been doing, of course, for the last 25 years is assuming we could run the entire world and, in fact, that we could shape the evolution of local politics in a particularly, for lack of a better term, progressive direction. And I think what we've learned over 25 years is not only are we not very good at doing that, trying to do that actually tends to backfire. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to be clear, um, in Asia... Is it your view that there's, uh, in, in terms of the nature of the Chinese uh, hegemony to fear, is it your view that there's any chance of them using military force to subjugate any nation other than Taiwan? Uh, I think that's very unlikely. Okay, okay. so that's not your concern. Right. I, I think that uh, they would uh, like a relationship with their neighbors that's not uh, dissimilar to the American relationship with countries in the Western Hemisphere. You know, we don't, uh, not anymore anyway, we don't invade Mexico or Canada. Uh, We've been staying out of Central America uh, recently, but we don't want foreign powers to have military bases here. We expect a certain amount of deference. Uh, we we want to have a series of weak neighbors that don't challenge us in any particular way. And I think that's what China would like. I don't think they want to try and invade Vietnam or conquer Korea or, you know, uh, go to Indonesia and remake its politics. I think they would like to not have to worry about the many countries that are on their immediate periphery. But, but does that bother you that they want what we have in the Western Hemisphere? I mean, is that what we're trying to prevent? Is that what a realist with, with offshore balancing would try to prevent? I, I, don't, I don't think they're being uh, immoral or, uh, or wrong. I think they're being, if, for lack of a better term, realistic. So I'm not surprised 
that that appears to be uh, their objective. I don't think that's necessarily in America's self-interest because a China that dominates Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere is also a China that's now free to project power all over the world the way we do. Uh, and in some cases, they might do it in ways we would find unpleasant. <laughs> what are the chances they do it as stupidly? Yeah, well, that is a possibility. And, and I actually wrote something a, a while back about uh, that there are times when a very effective strategy, of course, is trying to get your adversaries into doing stupid things. Uh, you know, getting them trapped in quagmires is often a, a very smart mm -hmm. strategy. Uh -huh. the one that we, uh, we have not followed very helpfully, but some of our adversaries have. I, I doubt they would be as heedless as we have been, but you never know. Um, well, I, I, at some point, I'd like to um, argue with you about more about uh, kind of your realism, officer balancing versus a progressive realism. There, there's largely overlap between the two, but maybe uh, some weeks hence, if you're still in book promotion mood, uh, we'll get you back here. Well, and we can talk one thing. I'd love to do that, Bob. And one thing we could talk about is um, what the form of a progressive coalition might look like. Because you can at least imagine um, uh, some genuine progressive, sort of non-interventionist progressives, mm -hmm. and realists like me, and even some libertarians, three tribes that don't necessarily agree on a lot of things, right. but do agree that the United States is overcommitted, the United States needs a smarter foreign policy. And the question is, can you put that coalition together and keep them together on some issues while recognizing we might disagree on yeah. some of as well no let's absolutely talk about that and i will i will email you about lining up another conversation on this uh forum so uh this is a book why don't you hold up your version again since this is the actual book and this is the galley okay. the hell of good intentions you know i hope it i hope it gets the attention it deserves it certainly deserves a lot i worry that even now they're they are whispering in the halls of think tanks isn't it better just to ignore the book if we just ignore him i mean even though he mentions us by name you think that's oh. happening uh, I don't think so. I think you. I, I think you will see some reviews. I think you'll see some uh, favorable reviews, and I'd be shocked if you don't see a few uh, pretty, uh, pretty nasty ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, nasty is better than none. I'm sure you will get some. I mean, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, one of the very most elite uh, publishing houses in the history of Western civilization, and you know, uh, very well, clearly written and clearly argued. And I encourage everybody to read it. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve. We'll see you next time. Okay.